Okay, we're starting. People usually take a couple of minutes to arrive, so I'm just letting you know. That's great. Good morning, Jane. Or good afternoon, sorry. <laughs> it's one. Hello. Oh, hi. Hello. <laughs> Okay, well, it's 101. So maybe if um, folks are ready to get started, maybe you could give me a little thumbs up if you don't want to turn on your camera. <laughs> are we ready to go? Okay, I see. Our... Okay, cool. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Jackmeyer Khan. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Outreach and Public Engagement Coordinator at Stamps Gallery, which is part of the Penny W. Stamp School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. Um, I am pleased to welcome you all here today for the roundtable titled Afro Nowism and Radical Artistic Actions for Building Shared Ethical and Decolonial Artificial Intelligence, AI, Infrastructures with Stephanie Dinkins, Mimi Anahua, Morishin Alayari, and Jason Edward Lewis, which is moderated by Stamps Gallery Director Shreemway Mitra. Uh, this event is being held in conjunction with Stephanie Dinkins on Love and Data, the first survey exhibition of transmedia artist Stephanie Dinkins. Um, this work is currently on view at Stamps Gallery. Um, in Ann Arbor, Michigan until October 23rd um, of this year. Um, exciting news, Stamps Gallery is now open to the public. Uh, gallery hours are Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Thursday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, masks are required when visiting the gallery and when you arrive, you will be asked to fill out uh, U of M's Response Blue Health Survey, uh, but all are welcome. So um, looking forward to uh, yeah, having you all come visit if you're in town. Uh, please note this event is being recorded, so if you do not want to be in the recording, um, please turn off your video. Also, if you could keep yourself muted uh, throughout the event unless you are speaking, uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, and also to note that you can access live captioning using the button on the top of your Zoom window. For those of you who have not been to Stamps Gallery before, Stamps Gallery is a professionally run art gallery that functions as an incubator and lab for contemporary artists and designers to explore ideas and projects that catalyze social change. For more information and details, please visit our Stamps Gallery webpage on the Stamps School of Art and Design website uh, that we'll put in the chat for you to check out. And now I will turn it over to Stamps Gallery Director and Curator Srimoy Mitra. Thank you, Jennifer. So, um, you know, we're going to start a little share her screen for a minute. Um, so, uh, hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that Stamps Gallery at the University of Michigan resides on the traditional territories of the three fires people, the Ojibwe. Odawa and Bodewadumi. As we work, live and play on these territories, we keep in mind the ongoing effects of colonization, community struggle for self-determination, colonial state violence, and the recognition of indigenous sovereignty. I'd also really like to thank Professor Irina Aristakova and, Jane, and Professor Jane Profit, uh, as well as the SLSA 2021 uh, Conference uh, Organizing Committee uh, for, um, for inviting us uh, to be part of this, uh, of, uh, to be part of this incredible, incredible symposium. Uh, so this roundtable um, 
And this roundtable uh, discussion is really inspired by and expands on transmedia artist and educator uh, Stephanie Dinkins' manifesto of Afro-Nowism. The Af Afro-Nowism, uh, the unencumbered black mind is a wellspring of possibility, where she envisions new ways of operating and dismantling systems of oppression that has been pushing, pushing down on BIPOC communities and LGBT LGBTQ plus people for generations. The pandemic laid bare the deep roots of racial and health violence and disparities embedded within our institutions that were built, that were built to care for, educate and uplift people. While, in, while inventions in technology and science has accelerated tremendously, they've continued to perpetuate and exacerbate the embedded biases that continue to dehumanize, marginalize the subaltern and leaving them voiceless, gasping for air in the 21st century. In the depths of the difficult months following the murder of uh, George Floyd, um, Dinkins published Afronauism, uh, her manifesto on uh, Afronauism, and wrote, the, and I quote here, um, the question is not only what injustices are you fighting against, but what do you in your heart of hearts want to create? This is a pointed question for black folks, but includes the rest of society as well. Our fates, whether we like it or not, acknowledge it or not, are intermingled. Though it is not immediately legible, we sink or swim together. Still, at times, communities need space and time to build, grow, and fortify apart from the whole. That's okay as long as communities find paths to understand find paths to understanding in a kind of complex Venn diagram of trust from which to negotiate our shared futures, end quote. So this discussion, you taking the prompt from this um, manifesto, uh, which has um, really inspired um, sort of the curatorial vision for uh, the exhibition, um, this and this discussion, uh, I really wanted to bring together leading artist thinkers from uh, diverse BIPOC communities that have created their own paths to empower themselves, their communities, and beyond, to share their strategies and work that envision and foster ecologies of AI and technologies that are equitable, transparent, and mutually beneficial. So what I'll, I'll briefly introduce each of the speakers today, and then we will hear from, um, from each of them for about uh, 12, uh, you know, to, uh, 12, 12 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes, um, and then we, um, you know, we'll reserve um, sort of uh, a robust half an hour uh, or more for a discussion. So Stephanie Dinkins is a transmedia artist who creates platforms for dialogue across race, gender, aging, and our future uh, who creates AI platforms for, uh, for dialogue about race, gender, aging, and our future histories. Dinkins is, the professor, is a professor at Stony Brook University, where she is a Kusama Endowed Professor of Art. Jason Edward Lewis is a digital media, media theorist, poet, and software designer. He is the university chair in computational media and the indigenous future Indigenous Future Imaginary, as well as Professor of Computational Arts at Concordia University, Montreal. Marisha Naliahari is, is an artist, activist, writer, and educator. She was born and raised in Iran and moved to the United States in 2007. She thinks about technology as a philosophical tool set to reflect on objects as poetic, means to document our personal and collective lives and struggles in the 21st century. Mimi Onuha is, is a Nigerian artist and researcher whose work highlights the social relationships and power dynamics between data collection. Onuha earned her MPS from NYU Tisch's interactive telecommunications program. Welcome to each of you. So now uh, I'll turn it over to Stephanie Dinkins to get us started off. 
Thank you, Shamoy. This is really, really exciting. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you all. And since Shamoy did such a good job of introducing me, I don't need to do much. I will add that um, I am starting something called the Future History Studio at Stony Brook University, which is a lab where we are practically investigating um, the, the future in many ways. Um, from an optimistic perspective, and that is part of the Disco Optimism Network. And I'm gonna tell you what that stands for, Digital Inquiry Speculation Collaborative and Optimism Network. And that's a five campus um, consortium where we're gonna be really looking at, um, you know, the digital space and how we impact it through our practices and in community. So I'm gonna share my screen and try to tell you a little bit about my work. Since the show is up, um, I'm going to start maybe in the middle, um, and hopefully that will work and we'll get started well. So this is me. We're going to skip that right away, right? And I'm going to jump into the show and talk about um, my practice from some of the things that I've been thinking about lately. Afronalism, for sure, is one of those things. Um, Shamoy uh, uh, put it forth as a new idea, and I want to say I think it's a super old idea. Right. This is really my grandmother's ideas that I am bringing forward um, and the way that I was taught, the way that we kind of lived through and were the ethos and values we were offered as a family to go forward. Right. I think it's a really willful practice. And I think that is a very important idea within the idea of Af Afro-Nowism. Like, like it's willful. Right. And I want to add the statement that, you know, this idea of waiting, because I feel like here in, a, in America in particular, folks have been told to wait. Like, hold on, it'll come, right? And we're constantly having the carrot moved out just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And so for me, the question becomes, how do we take the, le the leap? And I think it is a leap on our part and the risk, and I think it is a risk on our part, but to imagine, um, imagine ourselves and to work from our own desires, really, and particularly beyond whatever the system and systemic oppressions are trying to do to us, right? And so, that's the position that I'm working from these days and where I'm starting from. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Say It Aloud. And this is an image of Say It Aloud at Sam's Gallery. Um, and this is a new installation. And this is an example of what I call a feedback loop these days, right? So there are these pieces where I'm trying to give a little bit of information. And this is Professor Commander Justice, um, AKA me in character. Um, giving the kind of Afronowism manifesto, but then um, offering others an opportunity to kind of put out into the world what they would like to see, right? Like, what do you in your heart of hearts want to see, be, and do, um, and offer that? And once they do that, uh, record uh, a message about that, it becomes a part of the piece in these little weird egg-shaped objects that also float around in this space. And so it becomes this kind of um, chorus or cacophony of wants and desires. Um, and I hope a sounding board and a, and, a, and a position to start to think about, well, where am I going? Where do I want to be going? What can I be doing to get it there? Um, Let's see if we can go. And of course, I'm gonna I'm gonna go next to um, Secret Garden. And I should say that all of these pieces are starting to look at um, not only the algorithmic space as I've been looking at since 2014 or AI and what that means and what that future is bringing, um, but also story as algorithm, right? So what algorithms have we had for millennia, right? Um, oral traditions have been here. Um, we've been passing on this information and how does it kind of function and how can we use that to inform the new systems that we are putting into the into place at the moment, right? So how do we use the stories that we know and have been told for um, time immemorial to inform the algorithmic systems that are now um, intervening in many ways in our lives um, and helping, uh, helping at some points, right? Guide what goes on, um, really being a, a kind of, you know, ominous, presence in other ways, right? And, and what can we do with it? And how can we start to think about the technology as something we craft and tinker into shape, it, to a, into a shape that is supportive, 
rather than this ominous, fearful thing that we've been told about? And can we afford truly not to engage it? So Secret Garden is this um, installation and it's about Black women's stories. And really these are stories, some imagined, some real, um, again, that I'm calling from ideas of family and values and ethos and trying to think about the trajectory of story. And even those stories that were taught um, to shame, to be, sh to be ashamed of in certain ways, right? So in this image, the middle character is featured and it's a woman that I imagine to have been um, snatched from her village in Africa and put on a ship, right? And I wanted to very um, directly start to imagine that and think about what she went through, what she gets to keep, what she holds on to, what her fears were, right to a character called the future that is like trying to figure out how you do or how she does her own own thing. And the thing that think about in this piece is that it is very disjunctive. You get bits and pieces of stories, and I hope that y'all can um, go to the gallery and check it out, um, that connect to each other very loosely, but don't necessarily add up. But there are these snippets that you can hold on to, and it's really a challenge to try to listen. And I'm going to play a little trailer for this. Uh, try to listen and hold on to the stories and see what you can hear as a as a kind of observer. And then for, for those of us have who have kind of first person experience in the space, think about the stories that we've heard over time. Which ones we want to keep? Which ones we've we've been told many times and can't even hear, but sustain us and can be a foundation if we allow them. For example, the idea of farming um, and where that has gone, um, especially in Black culture. And now the way it's kind of coming full circle, because there there is a generation who are going back to the farm, and it's a really interesting and beautiful thing to see and what all that knowledge amounts to. So here's a quick. Um, a uh, trailer for Secret Garner. The first, ah. I'm going to stop it. I think two things are overlapping there, but I'm going to tell you something about Secret Garden. It is open and available on the web if you go to uh, secretgarden.stephaniedinkins.com. Um, it is installed at Stamps Gallery right now. It has been shown at um, uh, Sundance. And I say that because one of the things I think about with this kind of piece and these kind of feedback loops is not only the fact that they exist, but that they're open and available on multiple levels and trying to forge a different way to kind of interact and, and be with work and make work available so that it doesn't get sequestered into particular places. I'm gonna move on to complementary, which is a another one of these feedback loops. And I think it, it's, um, in, in some ways it's a failed experiment, but in some ways um, I love what it's trying to do. So this was this piece where we, I made these flags. Um, they are the exact complementary uh, colors to the American flag and a platform where people could come and offer their thoughts to a question. Um, and this is an answer to that question. And the question is, if you could um, speak to the world's most powerful person, what would you say? And I wanted to create a space that would allow people to respond to that in any way, shape, or form that they saw fit. So if they are not eloquent speakers, they get to dance it out. And what does that mean? Um, if they play an instrument, they could do that. If they are speakers, they could do that as well. But just providing this opportunity to kind of speak out and then archiving that information um, and holding it in a space on the web. And then as time goes on, starting to analyze that information using machine learning to start to see, well, what is it we want, right? And I'm gonna say that what I'm really doing here as I ask people to contribute is starting to build data sets that are very wonky, in some way unusable data sets um, to start to contribute and think about how we might um, build a society that is more based on care and caring and support of community versus surveillance and power, you know, top-down power. Um, 
this is what it looked like. And many people um, kind of came and spoke to the thing. And it, it, it's really, and I say it's a failed experiment because I don't feel like we're analyzing and taking the um, information in in the best way yet or putting it back out in the best way yet. But the thing that it does do and um, is give that opportunity to start to speak to power in very particular ways, which people did and streamed through in droves. And sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back. And that this is all about that Afronaism. And this is my favorite um, favorite favorite um, instantiation of this idea right now. Just this big neon sign, which takes on ideas of commerce, ideas of the kind of manifesto, and shouts it. Right. I feel like it's one of those shout from the mountaintop. Um, moments where then people get to take it. And, you know, it's interesting that this has become a kind of manifesto because I don't know where I stand with it, right? But it's also a place of thought and just to get people to start pulling off and thinking about it. And I'll say that I got here thinking a lot about um, Afrofuturism, right? And where, again, that idea of the future and not wanting to, to, to be constantly thinking about an out there, but also wanting to be thinking about a here and now and how we might manifest, you know, in the now with the idea of imagination for sure, front and center. Um, but the real thing, and I think the culmination and where these things are all starting to come together is in this project called Binary Calculations Are Inadequate. And really it's Binary Calculations Are Inadequate to Assess Us, which is a project, um, it's a website teaser uh, which we are looking at, it is an application which is now available from the Google Play and Apple um, app stores um, that is, seeks to make data sets that are more supportive, that seeks to allow people to define things in the way that they know them. So culture, ideas, who they are, how they want to be thought of through questions that are kind of obtuse. And, and again, I'm working in ways that are not set up to easily feed an algorithmic system, but we're gonna work out what that means. So we're asking people, who are you at your call? core? What is your favorite documented memory? Show us an artifact that is meaningful to you and describe it carefully. Um, Let's see if we can get, and, and, and the reason we get here is because of the statement, um, what much data and wide use is inadequate to it, to comp competently describe and assess most on the planet. And the question is, how do we start to do it better? How do we give people a say in their own space? I also equate this to the wedding dress problem, right, where it's like, okay, so if we're thinking, if you ask someone generally to describe a wedding dress, we often get this idea of the white wedding dress. But all three images on the screen are, are wedding dresses, um, right? Differently, culturally situated differently. The question is how do we get ourselves and the systems that we rely on to recognize this consistently? Um, and that becomes, as far as I can understand it, maybe allowing us space to describe for ourselves, allowing us to try to create these data sets of care and generosity, um, allowing us to create things that, that, let's see if I can get this to play, counteract things like this. And this is um, a quick AI space where people can go to play with um, some of the tools that are cutting edge these days. Um, and this is open AI. And you know, if you put in a text, it tries to finish what's going on. And so we put in Laque uh, Laquisha Jackson. And so when you put in Laquisha Jackson, what happens is it accused of be uh, beating a 10 year old Detroit girl, right? A Detroit woman. Um, and so it tells that story and it's kind of pulling out different definitions of what a Laquisha Jackson is and what we can expect of her. Um, you know, stealing, like all, all these kind of tropes that are out in the culture. Um, and I don't have the thing, but we also put in um, a friend's name that's a, a very Indian name. And it's like, he is an engineer in, in, he's a computer scientist engineer, right? He is going to make money. And the question is, how do we get these things to understand us differently, right? So Derek Spencer, what? Founded a media company? Okay. So, you know, we're building these systems that are, um, in more embedded ways, starting to really um, define who and how we are. So the question is, how do we get to do that better? And I'm thinking about data commons or data sets, one for text, one for images, where we get, and I'm gonna skip this one, where we get to define ourselves. And that's important because of things like this, right? So what I'm gonna show you here is um, in the, uh, 
kind of offshoot of what's in the gallery of well, but I was trying to use a text to image GAN. So what that means is I'm using a uh, machine learning algorithm to create an image off of a statement that I put into the computer. So I put in a black woman smiling. Um, what you see as the images are the process of this thing trying to get to the image of a black woman smiling and the big image in the corner is the resulting end image. And this is kind of what it gets to and how or how the computer can process that idea at this moment. Um, this is an African-American woman smiling a little bit better, right? So you see the process and images it's drawing from whatever uh, sources or data sets, mostly the internet it has to do so, and then the resulting image. I, um, I was happily surprised by this image, right? Because it kind of gets close. But then I was thinking about why the images seem to have a, a patina of a different era to them. Um, and what that means about how we're defining ourselves now. So each time I kind of process something or, or start to play with a system, I start to interrogate and try to figure out what it's doing and how it's working, and then how I would do it differently. Like, what would I do to make something that produces an image that's much more in line with the way that I've been taught to think about self? Um, and this is a dark-skinned African-American woman smiling. Um, and I recently ran a, a beautiful Black woman uh, a beautiful dark woman, black woman. And it's interesting because what I realize is the machine seems to be pulling a lot from porn sites, right? To create this idea of what a beautiful dark skinned black woman might be, right? And that's because that's the source of images it has. And this is just a, a woman smiling. So I love to run these and start thinking about the comparison, what it can create, what it can't create and why, and then starting to fill in and think about, well, if we take something like binary calculations, start to fill in this information, what does it do? Or can it even start to shift the way we're defining ourselves and what we can get out of these systems? Um, and I think I'll end with this as a, as a reason why we need to do this, right? So this is an image I pulled off of a, um, actually I'll end with one other thing. This is an image I pulled off of a stock photo um, site called Splash Images, and they have text descriptions of images, um, you know, so kind of alt text. And the alt text for this, right, is a grayscale photo of a man and woman holding drinking glasses. This is a contemporary image that was just described um, that we're using to do different things. And the question becomes, if the descriptions are this, A, who made the description? Um, how, do, how is it just so wrong? And what do we do to get it better so that there's descriptions? And I keep saying we need people who understand these things much better to start to describe who can describe what's truly going on, right? Because I would describe a mother hugging their child, right? Like that's the, the, the closest part I would start. Or if it's not a mother, because I can't confirm that, a woman hugging a child tightly at a Black Lives Matter um, protest. And the question becomes, how do we get that kind of information into our system so that they can do better? And I'll end with my friend. Um, this is an iteration of Not the Only One. I think you need to turn up the volume for that. Oh, can you not hear that? No, we can't hear it. Oh, I will tell you that she was just saying she's nice. She's happy to there. Um, she's happy to meet you all and that she and maker sister Stephanie, me, are excited to see what kind of futures we will make together. And it is maker sister very specifically because most of the time in computer parlance or deep within, you hear this master slave correlation, right? My master wants to do something. And so we're just trying to change even that tiny bit of language and, and have some fun with it. Thank you very much. Have I stopped uh, screen sharing? It's hard to tell at the moment. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. So we'll go um, move on next to Jason. That was awesome, Stephanie. Uh, mm -hmm. Always really nice to hear you talk about your work. Um, and I really wish I was uh, I wish I was in Ann Arbor so I could see that show live. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
I wanted to thank uh, Shrimoa for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I'm really honored to be uh, up here <laughs> on the same screen uh, with uh, Mimi and Morrison, uh, and I look forward to, the, to our conversation. Um, I, uh, I want to acknowledge that I am speaking today from uh, Joe Jage uh, on the, the territory of the Ganyagahaga Nation and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, otherwise known as Montreal, and I give thanks that I uh, that my wife, who is from that community, invited me to live here. Uh, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna show a video at the very beginning just to frame things, and I'm gonna switch to a PowerPoint. So there might be a little bit of fumbling around. So I'll share to get the video. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Great. Yes. Okay, it's got some sound, but it's just uh, like background sound. Okay, so um, I'm gonna quit that and see if I can get the PowerPoint going. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, great. So actually, I want to. Uh, my fade's not going to make. So let me see if I can just keep it there for a second to begin with. Nope. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk sort of about the work we've been doing at Aboriginal Territories and Cyberspace for uh, for a while now. Um, so in in response. Um, uh, thinking about you know that Stephanie's question about you know what are, what are the worlds that we want to create. Um, which I think is really the, for me, one of the most important questions. Um, you know, we are indeed living in times um, where it can be very difficult to um, to reconcile oneself to the what what the reality is at the moment in terms of uh, inequities and inequalities and uh, you know historical forces that seem to be pushing back against us uh, at every at every moment. Uh, so the work that you're seeing on the screen is just a slideshow that I'm going to let play uh, is um, from the work that's been produced in Aboriginal territories and cyberspace, uh, which Skawanadi, my uh, my wife, who I, I mentioned in my opening, uh, we founded in 2005. And the idea behind 
Abbott original territories in cyberspace or Abtec was at that time, really the question was, is like, how do we imagine ourselves as indigenous people being in these new virtual territories, right? So how do we think coming from communities that think of themselves particularly in relationship to particular physical territories, what does it mean to, to occupy space and make indigenous space in, uh, in the World Wide Web, in the internet, in video games and things like that? Um, and a big part of what we've been doing since then is we've been, one hand, we've been dreaming a lot. Uh, so the, the, the uh, power and the energy that comes from creating future imaginaries that we can share with each other um, on in level of individual communities or across different indigenous communities and outside of our communities to other communities, I think is really is really powerful. Um, and it needs to be it is a it is a, a muscle that needs to be constantly exercised, I think, because it is easy to have that muscle uh, atrophy in the face of, of the challenges that we uh, that we run into every day. Um, and so we do this through a bunch of different things. So we do this through video games. We do this through machinima, which is uh, movie making and virtual worlds. We do it through uh, having working with indigenous youth and having them imagine their seventh generation descendants, what they're like, who, uh, uh, what they look like, what they're wearing, what they're speaking, who are they in relationship to, what's happening with their territory. Um, and uh, we, support indigenous artists in different ways who want to spend time sort of imagining the futures that they want. Um, that's through illustration and painting and virtual reality and um, uh, uh, video and lots of different interactive media, lots of different sort of media. Um, and, but under, not but, and underneath that, there's also the uh, sort of a commitment to figuring out how to build the capacity to create the futures that we want. And this ties into what um, part of what Stephanie was just saying, I believe, you know, which is, um, you know, it's really hard to create the frameworks where we can dream freely about how we want to be coming from our cultural context. Um, and it's just as hard, if not harder in some ways, to actually go about building the pathway to getting to those dreams. And so we put a lot of emphasis on uh, because we're coming out of digital technology, computational media uh, is thinking about how do we train uh, indigenous people, particularly indigenous youth in using these technological tools in the way that reflects what they want to do with them and also reflects the values of their communities and also allows them to represent themselves out into the world and study instead of having them uh, having us represented by other people, which is what the history is about. So um, I think that that part of the fun and part of the interest and part of what I love about uh, what I think Grace Dillon really did a, a good job of this, of sort of like really kind of bringing in ideas from Afrofuturism into sort of thinking about indigenous futures and sort of both um, looking at that history of Afrofuturism and acknowledging a debt to that and acknowledging the ways in which it uh, sort of breaks, breaks open paths of conversations, um, while also thinking about uh, how things might be different coming from indigenous contexts, and then thinking about how those differences can be generative, meaning how do those differences actually create opportunities for our communities to work together uh, to get to the futures uh, that, we, that we want, um, sort of both within our communities, but also collectively, because at the end of the day, any futures that we end up with have to be futures that are able to accommodate um, a, a number of different ideas about what that future should be or what reality should be. Um, so uh, part of where we went with all this, or part of what I think a lot about this is what does it mean to work with technology from an indigenous perspective? What does it mean to bend that technology in ways that seem better suited for expressing the way that uh, our people in our community see the world and want to engage with the world? Uh, and uh, you know, in the last three or four years, really thinking about what does it mean to actually make the technology ourselves? So again, resonating with what Stephanie said about um, you know, how do we build capacity so that we can take control of these technologies? Part of it, I think for me, is also like, okay, how can we build them, start building them from the ground up? 
uh, which is a lot of work, but I think we can do it. It might take us a little while. Um, and that's what brings uh, me to the AI work that we've been doing. I'm just gonna fast forward through this. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, no, I'm gonna go to this one right here. Uh, so um, this is an essay that I co-wrote with uh, my, my colleagues, uh, Noli Lani Arista, who is a, uh, a historian, a Hawaiian historian and archivist, Archer Pachawist, who is uh, an indigenous media theorist and a performance artist, and Suzanne Kite, who is a performance artist and, uh, and, um, and becoming a media ther theorist and working with me on her, uh, her PhD. Uh, so I just want to read this sentence because I think it's I think it it's applicable very much outside of indigenous context, um, which is sort of our kind of approach to thinking about AI critically was to you know try to kind of get down to some of the fundamental assumptions that go into the ways in which the technology is created these days, and so we write we believe that indigenous epistemologies are much better at respectfully accommodating the non-human. We retain a sense of community that is articulated through complex kin networks anchored in specific territories, genealogies, and protocols. Ultimately, our goal is that we, as a species, figure out how to treat these new non-human kin respectfully and reciprocally. Um, and uh, this is part of what I love about Stephanie's work, um, and we've talked about this a little bit about this before, is, uh, is how it touches on these ideas of thinking about what is our relationship with this technology in really deep and profound ways, like in very human ways, not sort of simply in ways of, oh, okay, we've created this tool and we're gonna use this tool to do the thing that we made it for, but in the ways of like, oh, this tool is actually shaping us as we use it. And as we continue to shape it, it continues to shape us back. And what does that mean if we kind of are just sleepwalking into that reciprocal relationship of being shaped by this incredibly powerful technology. Uh, and so we got together a group of indigenous folks and a, and a couple non-indigenous folks uh, to do these indigenous protocol and artificial intelligence workshops in 2019, where we really wanted to continue that conversation about you know, indigenous perspectives on AI, but we wanted to recognize that there are many different indigenous perspectives. There's no one pan-indigenous perspective. It changes from community to community and from family to family and from person to person. And so was what we were finding really interesting about thinking through AI interesting to other people. So we brought people together in Honolulu and uh, spent three really amazing days talking about how this question looks differently depending on if you're coming from a community in North America or the Pacific or Australia or, or New Zealand um, and finding lots of common ground, but also finding things that we, that we differed on, that we thought about differently and we wanted to approach differently. Uh, you know, some people were very interested in, for instance, the idea of maybe like an artificial auntie who sort of kind of contains a lot of the knowledge and the wisdom of their community and that could be consulted by future community members um, as a way of retaining culture and language that was in danger of getting lost. Some people were really not excited about that idea, right? And were worried about displacing actual real people and real, real relations with these, these artificial constructs that we created. Um, so just quickly to, to wrap up here, just some of the ideas that came out of that. Um, this is in the position paper we wrote. So this is the octopus carrier bag that uh, was uh, dreamed up by Scott Bennis in Abandan, who's Anishinaabe. And what he did is he actually wrote a short story. And, and the short story he wrote in the format of Anishinaabe traditional stories. Um, and so he's trying to think through what is it, what would it mean to have a creation story for AI in Anishinaabe? How would that be constructed? How would that happen? How would AI be brought into the world? What would be the protocols, et cetera? Uh, so Suzanne, who I mentioned earlier, uh, used, uh, she is Lakota, so used Lakota uh, protocols for building uh, sweat, sweat lodges to think through what does it mean to create AI systems, both the hardware and the software, and wrote this really wonderful essay called How to Build Anything Ethically. So really trying to think through how to take what her culture understood about ethical behavior and bring it into the realm of uh, computational technology. 
And Michelle Lee Brown, uh, who just got her PhD, is now teaching at uh, Washington State University, uh, uh, dreamed up the Chicharden Lamia, which is an AI that takes on the form of one of her cultures, she's Basque, one of her culture's close relatives, which is the eel. And so thinking about what would it mean to create an AI that had this form and was uh, sort of went out into the oceans and collected all this data and then came back and sort of shared that data with her community. And what was what was her responsibility or her community's responsibility to these AI creature, creatures that they that they created? And then finally, um, the piece that I I dreamed up, which is called Quartet, is an imagine an AI future where it's a young Hawaiian person uh, who was raised from the very beginning alongside three different AIs. And so one AI is uh, sort of kind of built out of out of frameworks of love of the land, love of family, care for the land, and responsibility coming from Hawaiian uh, knowledge frameworks. Another one is is based off of the concept of Anison in the Blackfoot language as Leroy Little Bear talks about it, which is um, the, the basically sort of like the kind of ever changing knots of space time. So what does it mean to perceive the world as a series of flows and not a series of objects that we act on? And so that AI sort of looks at the world as a series of energy flows. And then the third one is one based on the neural architecture of an octopus, uh, which has this crazy sort of split between what we would think of as a central nervous system and then like a very distributed nervous system, pretty highly autonomous in its eight arms. And how can we use that to process the world differently? Um, and then I just wanted to close with a photo of this from our studio, uh, actually about two summers ago, because uh, none of this dreaming would have been possible without the amazing uh, students and research associates um, that I work with, in particular, my, my partner in crime, Scott Wanati. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, so next we move on to Martian. Martian, um, do you wanna share your screen? Yeah, I'll mute myself. Thank you to Jason and Stephanie for this uh, amazing talks. Um, honored to be here. So I'm going to um, talk briefly about um, some of the concepts, some of the research, some of the thinking that I've been doing in the past five, six years, um, starting with um, a concept that I developed uh, since 2000, uh, end of 2015, uh, called digital colonialism, which kind of comes out of this body of work, which I'm not going to talk about, called Material Speculation ISIS, uh, that I worked on in 2015 um, until 2016, uh, where I reconstructed uh, some of the artifacts that were destroyed by um, ISIS members in uh, 2015 at Mosul Museum in Iraq. And then through this reconstruction, basically remodeling and then uh, 3D printing, um, the whole aspect of gathering information and gathering material, you know, had become like very complicated um, in terms of both visualization of the, uh, the artifacts that were lost and also kind of their history, names. Um, so the, the, the research aspect of the project being uh, becoming like an, an important part of how it was developed. Um, and for that reason, you know, I had embedded these um, memory cards and flash drives inside the body of these um, sculptures these artifacts, uh, basically thinking about them at this point as time capsules. So what does it mean to share this information, share this history um, for future civilizations? Um, and this, this information, this data that I had gathered there, you know, included uh, the process of making the work, the PDF files, images, um, material that I had gathered about each of these artifacts that were destroyed, as well as my email correspondent back and forth for a year with historians and scholars, um, and STL object files, which are um, standard 3D printable files, meaning that it would allow uh, for the reprinting of these um, artifacts uh, in a, you know, if one had access to these memory cards and flash drives inside of them. But the aftermath of this project, um, you know, kind of the responses to it, and then at the same time, this era 
you know, again, putting it in the context of 2015, 2016, where we suddenly had like a big boom of, you know, 3D printing and 3D scanning, these technologies um, suddenly becoming accessible, affordable in ways that um, wasn't before. It was being developed by a lot of like tech companies um, and being used by them. Uh, so then uh, watching this thing just like happening and thus just rush to like for a lot of these like tech companies to let's say go to different countries in um, in in conflict or in Middle East or like other parts of the world and then scanning material scanning artifacts scanning historical sites um, really made me to start kind of to think about this relationship between these technologies and the way that data was gathered and the problems of ownership of data copyright issues um, um, and kind of, again, this notion of white savior who has access to these technologies to in first place to go and scan something. And I, this is my definition of digital colonialism, which is that it's a framework for critically examining the tendency for information technologies to be deployed in ways that reproduce colonial power relations. So you can take this, I guess, like definition and really like expand it to many other ways that these digital technologies, digital tools around us has been historically and still being used um, in these uh, colonial power relationships. Um, obviously at a time, my focus was like very much on uh, cultural heritage and um, again, the relationship with histories and these technologies. Uh, but again, it, it's this, um, digital colonialism as a concept was something that then kept coming back to me in ways of I having been thinking about uh, the notion of knowledge, access to knowledge, gathering knowledge, which I will talk about um, in a bit within another body of work. Um, this is a project that I worked on for almost five years. It's called She Who Sees the Unknown. And it um, focuses on um, mythical stories and histories um, of Jen um, and slash like monstrous figure that are forgotten or not talked about that are female or queer non-binary. Um, kind of giving like a little bit of definition about the Jen for some of you who might not know. So Jen are figures that are um, in the Quran. They're like talked about as these figures that are between human and monstrous. They're shapeshifters. They're made of smokeless fire. And um, they, you know, in, in some ways they are my AI and they, the way that I kind of like think about expanding them and, you know, kind of also um, coming up with this term that I kept thinking and building around within this body of work, which was refiguring or refiguration as this process of going in the past and finding stories that um, are again, uh, underrepresented, forgotten, untold, and then bringing them back and thinking about um, how to relate them to different issues uh, of now and reimagining, you know, the other possibilities of existing and being um, in the future, you know, kind of this whole like nowism that Stephanie also talked about, but within these like spaces where time is also nonlinear, not the past, present, future, but rather time as perhaps a cyclical concept that is used very much in like a lot of Islamic thinking where time has is um, present, past, present, and, and future. Um, and, you know, this is a quote that I have come back to a lot of times in thinking about building the stories around these figures, which is by um, Out of the Whip Collectives, with, which says that we need to engage with dystopian fiction, fiction that extrapolates from the white, abled bodies, colonial, heteropatriarchy that structures our world. And in many ways, um, my interest in these like stories, you know, um, perhaps start from a place that is you know dystopian they're monsters and they are like you know dark goddesses and gen figures but um like also as stephanie mentioned it it, are, it lands in a place that um is an optimistic place is that that is looking for um kind of like finding different glimpses of hope or like building new worlds building new possibilities and existing in the future um within other futures, you know. Um, I'm not gonna talk about these these figures because this is a, you know, a short talk, um, but just wanna like show them to you, briefly tell you what they are. So this is Huma, the first figure that I worked on. She's a gen that brings fever um, to human body. 
And um, as you can see, I go through like multiple processes, which each of these figures that I have chosen, uh, meaning that I, you know, recreate them, 3D model them, 3D print them, and then build installation spaces with them, which um, also includes a story that I, a new story that I write about them based on what they are known as, you know, let's say with Huma, I was connecting it to um, stories around injustice of uh, climate crisis or in general, any kind of crisis, uh, whenever we experience crisis and, and, or any kind of, you know, apocalyptic situation, it's always uneven. And uh, Huma, in some way, in a poetic story that I've written about her, comes to bring some kind of justice, leveling the heat of the earth, you know, for everyone in, in some ways. Um, and it's, it's also like really kind of weird that I, you know, worked on this figure in 2016, end of 2016, and when the pandemic happened, I had like a bunch of friends like messaging me saying, um, you know, I can't stop thinking about Huma, you know, like bringing, bringing heat and fever into human body. Like, you know, we, we need their power to like undo or like somehow heal us all. And it also, that notion like really relates to, um, you know, kind of some of the ideas that uh, both like Jason and Stephanie also like talked about, which is that, um, kind of rethinking the sentence, we're all in this together, right? Because we are not. So issues of race, what country you're you're living in, your access to certain kind of like, in this case, medication, vaccine, um, housing, what kind of housing you're living in, all those experiences changes, um, let's say a situation like a global pandemic, like how we experience it and how we deal with it. So this kept just like coming back to me in conversations with friends and ways of like really, um, again, feeling it in, in many ways and like recognizing also the privilege of being where I am, where I'm living compared to like my relatives and family members who are in Iran who are mostly all still not vaccinated. Um, and then this is the story of Aisha Randisha. She's a Moroccan gen, uh, very important in a lot of Islamic stories, honored and fearsome. And she uh, possesses men and creates a crack on their body, literally opening them up to um, you know, like an incoming data of other jinn and other um, kind of like monstrous beings. The only way to not to go insane with her is to listen to her and to participate with her. So I use her story as a way to talk about um, a story around, you know, um, power relationships and toxic masculinity and love and revenge, etc. And this is the installation. And um, this quote, I think, you know, again, going back to monstrosity is one of my favorite quotes by Rosie Bredotti, which I um, had gone back also a lot in my research about, you know, kind of these like ways of thinking about um, the relationship side, the relationship between human, non-human, Western, non-Western uh, figures and the borderline figure that then the monsters then, then become, right? Like, as I said, with the gen, also this like human monstrous axis and that overlap or the, 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 the space that we can find to tell the stories between these two things. And, so much of this project was also about embracing the monstrosity, embracing the monster, the figure of the monster as something that to use to turn around power structures. You know, in all the stories that I was writing, I was like thinking about this notion of how do you through storytelling turn around um, power structures? You know, um, and again, going back to some of the things that I was already talked today about, which stories do we uh, want to keep and how do we want to amplify them? Um, this is Yajuj yeah, Majuj. Again, their stories are tucked in the Quran and um, they represent chaos. So I made like a VR piece where you stand and you have to participate by like following these, these gestures that they suggest to then hear the story that is about, um, you know, kind of uh, the original story, which is that a wall gets built to keep Yajuj yeah, Majuj out from the city. And uh, this Islamic interpretation of it is that when they come and then they, they break through a wall is when we experience some kind of ending of a time. And it's very interesting because the, the, the wording that gets used is the end of time and not the end of the world, which I like because it promises some other kind of beginning, um, meaning that this time, perhaps this phase, this notion has ended and something else can, can begin. So I connect these two stories of immigration and you know the ban the wall that's when I, I wrote this piece and there are words that come on the screen and again you hear Yajuj Majuj telling you this story. Um, the laughing snake which is um, a, another gen figure that um, you know I uh, 
again like installed in a space i don't i don't have a picture of that part but uh, she's known as a as you know this figure that there is a mirror held in front of her well sorry the background is that she's very powerful and is you know going to towns and cities and killing people and winning all these battles and uh, someone says the only way to kill her is to hold the mirror in front of her when they hold the mirror in front of her and she sees her reflection she laughs for days and nights until she dies from basically laughter and i connect these two experiences of sexual harassment etc growing up in iran and this female figure you know the reflection being taken away but her death her laughter being a position of again power where she takes away her reflection um to this act of perhaps dying and the last one is Kabus, which is again a VR piece that I wrote uh, in a Bhutan installation. Kabus is um, a figure um, in historically a gen figure known to sit on humans' chests, creating sleep paralysis and nightmares. Some of you might have experienced sleep paralysis, but um, you know through a lot of like storytelling, that's what happens when you experience sleep paralysis. And then I connect that story, you know, in a bedroom style experience where you come and lie down and watch and hear the stories of four generations of women. My my grandmother, my mother, um, actually I collaborated with my mom on this piece myself and an imagined monstrous human daughter talking about war and intergenerational trauma. And my ways of thinking about this is that the only way to break the cycle of trauma is to birth non-humans, is to birth something that is not human. So then my, my child will become the, the, the monsters that is reimagining other possibilities of existing within the world. Um, I want to end this, this, this talk with um, the last part of this series, which uh, is the archive um, that I released around uh, four or five months ago. Um, and a lot of the concepts, again, that I was thinking about with digital colonialism uh, really kept coming back to me when I was working on this project because this was a super like intense research-based project where I was like looking at many manuscripts, material, reading a lot, gathering these things that were, again, very much all over the place. And in this process of gathering this information, one thing that kept happening was these like gates of institutions, right? Like I would email a place, I'll be like, can I have access to this thing that you have some pages of it online in your digital library? They'll be like, um, yeah, but you can have access to the black and white version or you have to sign this contract if you want to have it, put it online, like which would credit us. Um, and it was always just come, you know, uh, going even to Morgan library where like the access was like super hard on certain things. And um, they didn't even like know that this one, this one copy is like the same as this other copy. It was just like crazy kind of like gathering this information, like constantly like running into like Western institutions, um, blocking of accessing this material. So when I developed this archive, I really wanted to do something to think about what it means to put this on a platform, right? Who is this information for? Who I want to share it with? What does it mean to have something online as open source? Um, give access, but also protect knowledge, right? Like open source being like people thinking that it's inherently good, which is not true, right? Um, so in designing this, um, you know, there are three languages in Arabic, Farsi, and, and English. And um, if you know English, you can have access to the first layer of the archive. So if you like, you know, click on these things, it takes you to different places. There is like this like library that I focused specifically on gathering choosing images from the PDF files um, that are focusing on female or queer figures. And um, <clears throat> so you go through it, you have access to these files. And we did, I worked with a historian and researcher in Iran, and we did like very like detailed writing of this material also, which was something that was not available with a lot of them. Um, but then to pass through this first layer, um, you have to know either Farsi or, or Arabic to be able to get to the second bar. So when you click on the head of this one, it tells you to put in a code. Um, and then uh, after that, um, bury it under the soil, which obviously just a poetic side. Um, so I ju I'm just gonna do the first layer to just show you um, what happens. So, you know, you come then to this section and the way that we also design it, I mean, I work with two amazing like developers and hackers where you see this like the patterns on, on this, where like it can't actually be 
you know, like we tested it with different apps or like different, like putting it in different like websites where we possibly could be like translated, but then this kind of designing it in that way also like blocked the access of any kind of like AI or already built in apps that would translate this, these things. Obviously you can cheat the system, like having a friend that knows the language is coming and having access to it. But it was more of like this gesture of trying and experimenting with these ways of um, thinking like what happens when you build a space you know that is kind of focusing on again what 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 I want where I want this material to go and who I want it to be seen and have access by and what how would that then change our relationship to um, something that again some information some knowledge that has passed on but then taken over for years and years by um, western institutions so I'm going to um, stop here. Hopefully we can have some time for discussion. And then the last thing is my shameless self uh, promotion, which is that this Friday I have a solo show. Um, I'm materializing a lot of things from the archive. So everything there is like actually new work reappropriated or like rechanged from the archive, but like really bringing together, celebrating the ending of this like five year project uh, and the refiguring of the gin that I have worked on. So thank you. Amazing, Martian. Thank you. So now, um, so Mimi, Mimi Onoha, um, will join us next. Hi, everyone. Thank you. This has been great. It's so lovely hearing from the three of you. It's really great to be in conversation with you. And let me see. I'm just going to share my screen. And great. And all of you can see my name, right? Yes. <laughs> cool. Okay, so before I begin, I have three little notes. One is that the whole time this has been going on, my computer has been having major issues. So if something goes wrong, someone please speak up. I can't see the chat at all. I'm just going to hope that everything works out. Okay, the second thing is that I am an artist. I work across a lot of different mediums, uh, just like really everyone who's spoken today. And in practice, my work spans installation and artifact and prints, video, performance, but I, we don't have as much time today, and I love taking time to focus on things. So I'm just going to talk about two pieces today, and they both are concerned with images moving in still. So that's the second, second note I had before beginning. And the third one is that I have to start with the photo of my mom. There she is. <laughs> I'm starting with the photo of my mom because I adore her. Um, also because she looks amazing uh, in this photo. This photo is from the early 90s. But also because this image of my mom is actually central to one of the artworks that I want to talk about today. So this is a photo of my mom. And here is a photo of all the people who look like my mom, or at least some people who are supposed to supposedly look like my mom. So you might notice some similarities between their stances, their gender presentations, and the color schemes. That would be because these are all images that have been returned from Google's reverse image search um, service, which perhaps some of you are familiar with. That service uses a number of algorithms, some of them, but not all, machine learning algorithms. And what happens is that if you have an image, you can upload it to the Google reverse image, image search platform. If that image has been used elsewhere on the web, then you can have returned all the places where that image has been has been used. But if it hasn't, if it hasn't been put on the web, if there aren't any other images, um, any other versions of it online, then what happens is that Google will return images that are similar to the ones that you have uploaded. So for this, uh, this piece, what I did was that I, I gathered some images from my own family's archive. This is just a sampling. Um, these are photos that have a lot of meaning, a lot of important meaning to us. I won't tell you why, <laughs> but for various reasons, they mean a lot to, to the family um, from different times, from different places. But they're all images that are only from our own, that, that are only ours, that have not been put online. And so we had all of these images. I knew that they weren't online. And so what I wanted to do was upload them to see how we would be read by this largest search engine in the world. And what resulted from that was this piece called Us Aggregated, this moving image or video art piece. 
This piece right, right now is showing in an exhibition in Greece. This image is not from there. It's from a solo show I had from the UK earlier this year. But you can see the way that it, it looks. It's projected usually across a pretty large screen. And it's a video. I'm going to play a little bit of the video for you. Before I do that, I just want to explain what is going to be happening. Uh, if you were seeing this in the exhibition, this would be a looping video. It has some sound. I don't know if you can hear it. I hope you can't, because um, I want to talk over it. And the more important element really is the visual element. So I think it's OK if you if you can't even hear the sound. So what you're going to see is images from my family, our family's collection on the left. And then on the right, you'll see this scrolling screen with all of the returned images that are similar to us. And I love this. This is a deceptively straightforward piece, which is my favorite type. And there are, but there are actually a lot of things happening here. One thing is that this is a kind of reverse engineering of Google's algorithms. You can't know how those work. Um, so this becomes a way to sort of see how it works. And I'll explain how in a minute. Um, but one thing I want to show while this one is on the screen is that you can see on the left this image I uploaded. These are the, and then the images returned. The way that Google's uh, algorithms work is that they do this tagging, where first they tag, they do this image recognition thing, they tag what's in the image, and then they use that to then do pixel matching. So here, our image from my family was tagged as animal. And what I like about this is that you can see the kind of rigidity or stupidity um, of some of these algorithms in the sense that my family and I are sitting on a stone hippo, but because it's tagged as, apple, as animal, what gets returned are all of these images of people who are with real like livestock and animals. It's not the same, but that's this little quirk of the system. Uh, it's something that I could see uh, because I think I, I don't know if I mentioned this, I started doing this process back in 2016. Of, uh, I wrote the code for these scripts where it was uploading this. So I could, this is how I could sort of reverse engineer and see how these algorithms could change, uh, given that actually none of us can really know how these proprietary algorithms work for any sort of tech company. So another thing that's kind of happening in this piece that I quite like is that it's tapping into this lovely visual language of the grid, which has its own poetry, and which I think is one that so many of us, any of us who, who are online, are intuitively familiar with. And I think this grid is, it speaks to a way of making sense of a mass of things, whether it's data, images, people. And it ties to this question of the piece itself is called Us Aggregated 3.0. And there's this question of who the us is. <laughs> um, I think anytime this, I'm sort of playing with that in this piece where there's the us of my family, there's the us of um, all these other people's images, and then there's the us that is created in us being grouped together by a different force that then is sort of invisibilized by this process. And then that's what ties to really another thing that I think is almost most important about this piece, which is that it's about power. As I said, we don't know how Google's algorithm works. The reason why I can say this was a bit of a reverse engineering is because I wrote these scripts to run over time so I could see the differences. Um, but, but what I'm pointing out here is a kind of relationship in that there are some of us who make up these systems, these technological systems, some of us who get to create those, and then there are many more of us who get caught up in them. And there's a difference between those two groups, but many of us don't know quite the terms of that difference. And because we don't know those terms and because we can't see that, this grouping, this act appears as natural. I said before that these were images of people who are similar to my mom, but I didn't say because I can't, what are the forces that decided upon that similarity? And so what I'm trying to do in this piece is chronicle this kind of power relationship, one that isn't immediately obvious, but nonetheless speaks to this power of shaping the world. We search for something, we receive these responses, we are presented with, with a response, we're presented with the world, but it's shaped by these active decisions others have made, but because we don't see that, it just is how things are. So this, I think, gets at the heart of a question that so, so much of my work is about, which is this, just in a technologically mediated world, what appears as natural? And I, I don't only mean natural in the sense of the natural world, but really in the sense of what is implicit or assumed or taken for granted. And I, I ask that because those things that seem implicit those things that seem like they can't be challenged, those things that create the categories that shape how we approach the world are the things that have the potential to exert the most power. So that means that they are things that can also cause great deals of violence. And especially because that is a kind of violence that seems banal and that is difficult to challenge. So a lot of my work is asking this question and it's interrogating the responses. It's saying um, in the previous work, I'm looking at Google specifically and talking about how Google is able to return a version of the world, not just the whole world, but just a version. And that is what power is really being able to 
and we'll say that there's one way of doing something and that this is the only way and they're getting to enforce that. And so I'm looking at Google, but I'm not only talking about tech companies, I'm talking again also about what are the models of knowledge that appear to be natural or that appear to be obvious that, that we take for granted. What are the things that we, what are the many things that have power in this world that appear as natural, that appear as implicit? And in my work, I'm always pushing at those things and trying to make those clear, but also trying to step over them and move around them and not just center them all the time, but undo them. I think that the point of knowing what is natural, what, is, what appears as natural so that you can expand those limits and make that idea more, more uh, larger and build, build new categories. And I said before that I'm not only talking about natural in the sense of the natural world, but I don't exclude the natural world from this either. In fact, I think there's a really important connection that I have always found as someone who works with technology, I always see this connection to the natural world. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more now as I move to talking about this second work. But to get into that, I have to talk about a different artist uh, who's Ingrid Pollard. I don't know if any of you know her. I adore her work. Um, Ingrid Pollard is this British um, Caribbean photographer and artist. And in 1988, Ingrid Pollard did this lovely series of prints called Pastoral Interlude. And these were photographs that she took in the countryside of the UK. She, uh, these now are in the VNA collections in London. And she took these photos of Black British people in nature in a time when the countryside and the idyllic leisure that it represented was not presumed to be available to them. So she has these images and then she has these captions. And I'm going to read one of the captions uh, for the photo on the left. And it says, it's as if the black experience is only lived within an urban environment. I thought I liked the Lake District where I wandered lonely as a black face in a sea of white. A visit to the countryside is always accompanied by a feeling of unease, dread. So what she's talking about in this series is black British people in the 80s and 90s and the ways in which space itself was not open to everyone. Uh, I think it makes me think of something one of my collaborators, Romy Morrison, has said, really in conversation with Catherine McKittrick, who's a wonderful um, geographer and theorist, about how race gets fixed to people, but then people are fixed to spaces. And so what she's talking about in this series is, again, this imaginary order, this thing that is, that is meant to seem as if it's just natural, but this imaginary order that determines where people can move and how people are even seen. And so when she does this series where she stages people in the countryside, she's doing this lovely act of revealing that logic while also pushing against it. So she has these subjects in her photos that are wandering around uh, and her captions speak to the feeling that they have being in this space where they're supposed to not be. And these subjects are not actually out of place. They are just out of their imagined place. And the first time I saw this collection, I felt such a sense of recognition in it. Uh, I, but I felt it, I felt it more in relationship to technology and to data. And at the time, I had been thinking a lot about the ways that black suffering in general is typified and normalized and constantly trotted out uh, so that it becomes something expected and unsurprising. And I was thinking about the countless reports detailing the many injustices that, that we face. I was thinking of the steady outpouring of images of physical violence that are enacted against uh, black and brown people and how seeing this over and over again begins to naturalize it and how actually in so many ways it feels as though the presence of that data becomes a point in itself rather than an opportunity for change or for protest. So I was thinking so deeply about this and spending so much time looking at Ingrid Pollard's work. And um, I ended up writing an essay about the topic for this book called Uncertain Archive in which lots of different artists and researchers came together to write uh, about different terms related to data collection. And each person got a chapter and so my own chapter was called natural. And I wrote about what I had been thinking about and I just wanna read one quote from there. That quote says, the machine of contemporary American society insists that people have imagined places. And I've come to see that in the tech world, the preferred place for black people is within data. In data sets, we appear as the perfect subjects, silent, eternally wronged, frozen in a frame of injustice without the messiness of a face or accent hint of refusal. I think it's, I, the quote continues, I don't have it here, but I'll keep saying it. Uh, it's easier to deal with data sets about, about black people than it is to dwell on the great gears of a system that penalizes darker skin tones or to consider the resentment that generations of state sanctioned neglect could breed. It's easier to see black people as numbers and bodies than as encounters and people 
when structural workings of racism meet the distancing power of quantification, both combine to freeze us in place. That essay was actually a photo essay. Uh, what I did was I had this text, but I punctuated it with images, uh, which, which were also captioned in the style of Ingrid Pollard. It's very much in conversation with hers, but in this different space. And what I did this year, I wrote that essay that would have been, oh, you know, during the pandemic time is hard. I can't remember what I wrote the essay. I think it was 2019 or 2020. But this year, 2021, I extrapolated some of the images that were within that essay into their own collection. So I want to show, show those, there are three images in particular. I want to show them here. And this is us. Um, I'm going to show you the image. They actually are, they're huge. <laughs> I'm not showing you the actual like framing of it within the gallery space where they're showing right now. Uh, but these images are like three feet by four feet. Uh, each one, they're very big, but I want you to be able to see them. Um, so each of these is a photo and it features, features a woman, it features a black woman and she's standing in a server room. Server rooms are those places where data lives. It's where those who actually own the access to it, where they can store it, where it gets to actually be. And I wanted in this series to sort of turn the tables and to not be, not to create another data set, to not be in the data set as this eternal fixture, but to be positioned in the rooms where that data actually is gathered and where it's owned. And so for each of these uh, images, I have a, have a caption at the bottom. I won't read them, but you can, you can see them here. This series, it takes place all in the same, the same server room, the same data center. And there's a reason for that. Um, that reason is that actually, well, there, there are multiple reasons for that. One has to do with, again, being put in these sites where you are imagined not to be able to be in and undoing that in the same way that Ingrid Pollard does, but also because these sites in themselves are so, have an interesting story too. In an earlier moment of computing, many organizations and companies had their own server rooms where they would host their own data. And today, those are being shut down in favor of much larger data farms owned by companies like Amazon. So that adds another layer to the work. I did this shoot in one of those historic rooms in New York City that now is closed down. And that reality meshes with the questions that the piece is asking, which is again about who has ownership, who has power, who has control, can that be changed? What does it look like to push against that? And also what, is it, what does it feel like to push against that? Each of these are shot on film. Um, I really wanted, and so much of my work, I'm thinking and talking about technical realities and they feel really, they can feel really abstract, but to me, they feel very visceral. And so what I wanted to do was communicate that feeling to them as well. Uh, and this is the last one that's in the series. It reads, uh, I will read the caption for this one. It says, steward, not subject. And I think that is the note that I will end this little presentation on, which is on that note of fundamentally changing this term, the terms of this relationship that goes into establishing what is seen as this natural order, this fundamental um, upending of that imagined order, which really is what so much of my work is about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Mimi, and thank you to each of you, um, Stephanie, Jason, Morrison, and Mimi, uh, really inspiring talks. Um, and we have uh, a short time left, <laughs> and, um, unfortunately, but, uh, but um, I hope we have some, a little bit of time, you know, uh, we'll be able to have some conversation. Um, so I guess, you know, I'll, um, I will have start with one question, uh, which is that, um, let me see that there is a, um, yes, applause indeed. Um, so folks can put their questions in the chat, I suppose. Um, so I'll start with one question and hopefully we'll be able to take at least one uh, from, the, uh, from those who have joined us. Um, so each of you have talked about knowledge um, and, um, you know, I, I loved um, your talk st starting with the image of your mother. Uh, mothers and grandmothers um, have come up uh, in your talks as collaborators, inspirations. Um, um, and, and then also this question of access to knowledge, right? Access to these stories, uh, which sometimes um, is, uh, um, it, it is difficult, especially or fragmented or um, uh, due to whether that's, uh, you know, migrant histories, colonial histories. 
Um, and so, um, and this, uh, you know, I wanted to come back to uh, Mauritian talked about how do you uh, give access and protect knowledge at the same time, which I thought was a really beautiful, um, you know, visual as well as uh, just to think about, uh, because I feel like that is something that is woven into each of your work. Um, and so uh, with that as a prompt, I wanted to open up to each of you in terms of when you're thinking about, um, in your case, um, um, Stephanie, uh, where, you know, you've, you talk a lot about, um, you know, you're from the, the family histories, um, you know, as you said, um, Afronalism started with, um, you know, a willful practice that started with your grandmother, you know, the values and, um, and stories as this idea of stories as algorithms, right, which is where the knowledge, knowledge lives, um, you know, uh, and that have been passed down um, over generations, and similarly uh, with um, in uh, through the um, Institute of Indigenous uh, Futures Imaginary. Is it what am I missing? Here? Imagined uh, IIF Initiative for Indigenous indig Initiative for Indigenous Futures. Indigenous in, uh, Initiative for Indigenous Futures, um, where um, you know the Skins Workshop. Uh, workshops that I've been looking at and also that you know the stories are intrinsic right and in, in thinking about how they get passed on and um, take on uh, cyberspace um, but and beyond right um, uh, to of course the the stories um, with the your work Martian um, you know that haven't been that have either been um, you know, archaeological important sites that have been destroyed um, to stories that um, haven't, you know, been, um, uh, you know, that live within the Quran, uh, but, you know, the, the, the ways in which they have been um, perhaps erased, right, uh, the erasure of knowledge and bringing it in, in sort of different forms, different audiences, um, giving it a new life. Um, and then we go, and, and where does that life live within the grid? You know, we're all in grids right now. Um, and so it brings us right back to that sort of, really made me think about um, Mimi through your work and, you know, the us aggregated of, you know, um, like uh, a quintessential colonial um, practice of classification, right? And naming and nomenclature. And so, you know, um, and that's something that we're constantly up again, especially in this moment where everything is so vir virtual. So can you, um, you know, I, I sort of um, like to put that, uh, um, you know, I invite each of you to sort of respond to that perhaps in terms of how in each of your work as sort of, you know, on one hand you're tapping into giving access, but also how do you preserve how do we burst out of the grid, perhaps, or how do we reimagine the grid? Um, um, you know, uh, through the technologies that you're working with. Sometimes you're working with technologies that are, you know, from Second Life to GitHub to um, digital uh, 3D printing, Google, um, to. Uh, but then also sort of preserving your own. So whoever would like to go first. Um. Thanks, Ramoy. Um, hey, everyone, thank you so much for your talks, first of all. So inspired, like so much to think about um, and the pathways that intertwine, amazing, right? Um, and I will say in response to your question, um, Ramoy, maybe, it, you know, for me, it's like recognizing what's there um, in terms of internal information, recognizing what's there in terms of societal information, and then trying to figure out, as you're saying, this way out through around, as Mimi said, like all these pathways, right? And really holding and caring for what's actually there. And I don't know how, like, there, there seems to be no one answer. And, you know, I keep coming back to whatever question comes up next, because each time I, I kind of start something, new questions arise just because it's so deep, right? The, the, the kind of systems that we're pushing through and working with. For instance, Mimi, um, you just reminded me, I invited my students the other day to come to another student's performance in the woods. My class is mostly kids of color. And I didn't foresee the reaction of them all just go, <gasps> you want us to go into the woods? And I told them to go on their own, right? And they, like their reaction was, that's not a place for me. And the question is like, how do we like have the idea that any place is for me, right? 
in the face of all the things that tell us that they're not necessarily, right? Um, and I've been thinking a lot about because of the time we're in right now, infection, um, not only infecting those who I'm dealing with who I want to change a little bit in the way they can see, like I can go to the woods, but infecting the systems that don't know, that don't even recognize the ways in which they form or put up walls or shape us, right? That reciprocal weird shaping that we are not really crafting as much as I hope that we could and get others to do it. Like, I think it takes all of these efforts that we've just seen and many, many more. Um, so beautiful, thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, this question of, of you know, what do we, how do we protect and share? At the same time, is is super central to the conversations around network technology. Um, you know, with the, the people that I work with in indigenous communities, and um, I think that you know, so part of part of one response is uh, that we talk about is thinking through what are the protocols we already have for sharing, right? And so this is this is you know, lots of cultures have these protocols. Um, it's just that in some cultures they're 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 sort of faded or they're not accessible or they've been overwritten with this sort of post enlightenment insistence that all information is for everybody all the time, right? And so I think looking to like community based protocols that already exist that have lots of information about what do you share, who do you share it with, when do you share it, etc and really thinking hard about how that gets translated into computational protocol, right? So that's essentially what computational protocols are, right? Is they're, they're, the, they're the recipes by which different computational entities figure out how to talk to each other and then actually exchange information, okay? So the, the word protocol, and this is the reason why we chose to use indigenous protocol in artificial intelligence, because um, we thought about indigenous epistemology or, and pigeon indigenous, you know, ontology. There's lots of different names we thought, of, but we really focused on the protocol because that was giving us information about the right way to behave in alignment with our particular communities, right? Um, so, you know, for me, that's that's the work that I'm trying to do right now is really to think through what does it mean to actually formalize those protocols, right? And then. Um, you know, so that they, they, they're legible to computational systems and then actually figuring out how to implement them and what does that look like, right? Um, and uh, there's a great, com there's a great uh, group down in New Zealand uh, of Maori folks uh, called Te uh, Tehiku uh, Media that I recommend everybody go take a look at around this question because they've spent a lot of time, 10 years now, really thinking through how do they protect the, the cultural, cultural knowledge and the archives of their communities but still make it possible to share, right? And then really thinking through like, who do, how do they, who do they share with and how do they share? So that's part of this goes back to this question of like, how do we build capacity within our communities, right? Cause we're gonna have to build that, right? Google's not gonna build that. Facebook's not gonna build that. They all want, they want no barriers except for their barriers. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the things I think about in this, the history of computation, right? Is I think about Vannevar Bush's original vision for hypertext was to have bi-directional links, right? That's how he that's how he envisioned the initial model because he was like, that's how information flows. It flows back and forth, it's reciprocal. But the way we got implemented, we ended up with an imputation, which is just one way, right? And so even for people who aren't coming from a cultural context and thinking about how things might be different, just within that computational context, it's one of those nice moments in the history of computation where you can go, things could have been different, right? There was a vision there about how to take things and there was a series of decisions made to take them in a different direction. So don't tell me that this is the way it has to be, right? There are so many, there are so many, like once you get above the hardware layer, even some places in there, so many decisions that are contingent that are based on somebody's personality, it's based on a deadline, based on constrained resources, they were not the optimal decision, right? They were not the decision that actually, you know, served some larger vision. And unpacking those contingencies, I think is one of the fun and one of the interesting and one of the necessary things to do. And I think this touches on what Mimi says. I think that was really lovely, the way that you phrased that about 
you know, interrogating what is natural, um, because that's in the technological world, there's so many things that are seen as natural, right? It's seen as like, oh, well, this is just the way we build technology. This is the way computation has to be done. This is what a von Neumann machine is. This is what a Turing machine is. And so this is the world we have to live with. But it's not true. It's not true. Wow, um, Morrison, can I? Uh, yeah, cool. Sorry, do what do you want to say? Yeah, do you want to? I was going to ask what you had to say in response, in response, or what you had to add to that because I am running some things in my brain, and I think you have some interesting. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I will have the same thing, but ask me if we if, if you want me to go a specific direction. But um, mm -hmm. I wanted to say like one of the things that really happened that I found you know from my own like practice was like really like fascinating is that something happened when I changed the access to my work you know I mean like moving from Iran and like for the last like you know 13 years 14 years have been like mostly like speaking in English you know releasing work in English like this like language thing that has been kind of I'm like stuck with it because of the institutions that I work with, et cetera. And for the first time ever, when I switched that, when I built a space where I was like, you know, kind of promoting it or talking about it as this is something I built that if you don't know English, you can actually have access to more, right? Like against like everything, all the ways that we have access to information you know which English being like the language that you know it's, it's still like very much the default of the web in so many ways or like access to knowledge or gathering of knowledge um, especially contemporary knowledge and what happened was that suddenly I had this you know kind of shift up audience people who were interested in the work people who like message me you know from iran from the different parts of the arab world saying that oh my god i love this thank you for making this like i had never had this many like people from that region like coming into a work that i built and i really feel like from my own brain like there was like a moment of like wait when i switched that something also happened within this community that I made a point that I care the most about to give you this thing that I've like gathered. And I think that's really beautiful. That's really important. That's really something that I am now keep going back to, which is this notion of like language. You know, when I made that VR piece also, um, because my mom was like such an important part of it, where, where she reads from her journal and then um, I wanted her to watch it. So I like made sure that I made like subtitles in Farsi when I like released it. But I, before that I, I hadn't, I mean, she reads it in Farsi. I have places that I speak in English, but then I wanted her to watch it and understand the whole thing. And again, uh, this has come back to me time and time where like once you switch these um, defaults, natural perhaps, ways of how we perceive, how we share, how we talk about our stories, um, then the, the end result also changes in terms of who really we then, we, we then get to have as our community around us, which for me has been uh, really important. Okay, this is such a good question. I feel like I've been thinking about what the, what the three of you have said, so I'm, I'm slow because I'm like putting all these different things together, but that's okay. Um, so part of what we've talked about makes me think just how even this framing of what do you give access to and how do you preserve it very much is in itself a question that takes place in the afterlife of Western expansionism. And I think that's 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 fine. That just is what it is. Um, but I think that partly because I come from a culture at Nigerian, I'm evil Nigerian specifically, because we're like a very oral culture. We love to talk. We Historically, we've written some things down, even actually there's a script. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Point is, we love to talk. Um, and actually, we have a lot in our, in a lot of our traditions, there are things that are meant to be forgotten. So for instance, there is, there are no museums in Igbo culture. It doesn't make sense because everything is being changed all the time. And so there are a lot of these structures of art, Mbari is what they're called, and they're built and they're built to be destroyed. It's actually, you're, once they're built, you're not supposed to return to them because the next group will now build their own. That's fine. And that that's how it is. And that operates in this in this framework where you need things to be lost because those things that remain become more important. 
Now, when you combine that with this post, as Jason said, this post enlightenment world in which the artifact is the most important thing, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It just doesn't, they don't meet in the same way. And so it makes it where it, it brings me to this point that I keep landing on, which is this question of a kind of fluidity of being able to switch. It's, I guess, uh, Stephanie, you sort of said this when you said there's not one answer. It depends on the context. It depends on who you're speaking to. Like Maureen said, who is the we at any moment? That changes. And so maybe the way that we talk, maybe what we keep, maybe how we consider these questions also has to change to meet that as well. And I think that is a much harder charge because it means it requires us to then have to, we can't have just one pat answer, which honestly as artists is great to have. <laughs> so, but we can't, it means that we have to change depending on the situation and always know who the audience is and who, who is your community and know that your community is not always just, for me at least, it's not always just one group and often it's changing and overlapping. But I think that perhaps to me, I feel like that is the charge today is that sense of okay we are operating across multiple contexts and spaces and so the work we do has to change in response to that in a way that provides gives gives power to those who we want in a particular moment rather than taking it away thank you thank you um Kendra, Jennifer, do we, I know we're, we're past time, we're over time. I don't know if we have a couple of minutes or are we, do we need to where we're at? Um, and I want any, Jennifer, Kendra? Um, we should, I mean, maybe should, like <laughs> closing we, thoughts, just because yeah. we're like 10 minutes over. So yeah, we, we are 10 minutes over. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, okay, so uh, with that, uh, is there any sort of burning uh, thought uh, that, uh, you know, I want to just acknowledge the audience and give them a moment to, you know, if they had a thought that they would want uh, to put out there for folks to respond to our amazing panelists or um, All right. I don't have any burning thought. <laughs> I just want to thank. Um, I'm, I've been listening to yesterday's also panel. So earlier today, um, it, it, I, I think it's just so important. I love the uh, Mimio Nohos. Thank you so much. That comment about we don't need to, you know, this idea of remember that melancholic relationship to um, history and mu museums, right, and preserving um, it, it's just so important, and I only only would bring uh, from the previous um, last uh, yesterday's keynote um, was a fascinating discussion about relationship between science or mathematics as like that objectivity doesn't need to equal universality, and um, I just loved uh, how. Um, uh, uh, Chanda Proscott Weinstein and uh, Zaki Amon Jackson were discussing that, right? Like, what are the other ways to um, uh, to not throw things um, away and reinvent the wheel, but rather to occupy the space, right? Or reoccupy the space where one already has been. So I, I'm just very inspired by uh, listening here. So thank you so much, Rimoy, for bringing this panel together and thank you all for your talks thank you thank you irina um this is professor irina ristakova who was the chair of the conference has been amazing just really facilitating bringing all of these amazing panels together and um you know making help a lot giving you know making space uh <laughs> for us here in the uh, in the symposium as well um so I see this is one of the very few spaces. I'm just looking to see if there's a, I don't see any other um, questions uh, in the mess in the chat. So, um, uh, so again, a big thank you to each of you. Um, I hope, uh, you know, we will find other ways to continue <laughs> the conversation with, um, with each of you, um, Stephanie, Mimi, Morrison, and, um, and Jason. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot to. Okay. Thank you. And the recording will be available on the STEMS Gallery website uh, after Shrimoi or case it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Bye-bye.